So I'm going to say hi, everybody. You say hi, Stuart. And I'm going to ask you your name so I can get a better acquainted with you. You know mine. I need to know yours. You just say, my name is. I'm going to ask you where you're from. I need to know that so we really know you. And then I'm going to ask who it is that saves you, okay? Now, this is the last time we can practice. Tomorrow night's got to be better than this, okay? Hi, everybody. Hi, What's your name? Oh, where are you from? And who is it that saves you? Jesus. Oh, now I'm feeling a better at home. Thank you very much. Sam, it's great to worship with you again. I couldn't keep my eyes off of you. We haven't done that for a couple of years. Thank you. Folks, the uh, music wasn't supposed to be quite as hot as it was, but the guitarist was standing in the water. Did you see that? I think that's why we're going so fast there in the end. I'm not sure. Thank you for being here tonight. We're going to talk about... Uh, the only fundamental belief that you and I need to have. I'm going to try to talk about uh, Jesus more than anything else tonight. But haven't you already worshipped? Why? Thank you guys for bringing us to the throne of grace tonight. I was in London in a subway. I was actually going between subways down a long, narrow escalator. A long, long, narrow escalator. Lots of time to think. Way down there was another pl train that I needed to take. And all of a sudden, the guy just rushed by me, hit me in the side, and kept going real fast. And I immediately reached for my wallet. I was sure he had taken it, and it was still there. I was surprised. And I watched him. I wondered what else he could have taken. And he stopped down the escalator ways. And he, uh, he just stood there. And he turned around, and he walked back up the escalator. And he said to me, Hey, I'm sorry I ran into you. I'm in a real hurry and everything okay? And I said, yeah, everything's fine. And he said, well, praise the Lord. And he turned around and left. <laughs> Not what I had expected in the subway in London. And I watched him, kind of had a chuckle on my face. And I watched him and he went down a ways and he stopped. And he turned around and he walked back up the escalator to me. He said, um, are you a Christian? And I said, yeah, I am. Well, praise the Lord, he said, and turned around and walked away. <laughs> well, that's a nice way to witness, I guess. If I hadn't have been, I suppose I would have been happy for him too. But uh, anyway, I was just kind of smiling at this whole thing, and I watched him, and he stopped down there. And he turned around, and he came back up, and he said, uh, what church do you belong to? i got to admit to you that I hate it when people ask me that question. Because I know what's going to happen in the conversation. I'm going to tell him I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And he's going to say, oh, I know everything there is to know about Seventh-day Adventists. And what he knows won't be anything near to the truth. And I've been through this so many times in airplanes and uh, here and there and at grocery stores. And I, I think, oh, no, I don't want to answer this. But, of course, I'm a good witness. And I said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And he said, well, praise the Lord. And he turned around and left. And that was the end of it. I thought, well, I got off pretty easy on that one, and then he stopped. <laughs> and this time, before he turned around, he tilted his head, kind of like, should I ask him or not? I don't know. And he turned around, and he walked up the escalator to me. He said, um, have you gotten over that David Koresh thing yet? The only thing this guy apparently knew about Seventh-day Adventists is that once upon a time, David Koresh was one, and he wanted to know if we'd gotten over it yet. Well, I did my best to remind him that uh, David Koresh had left the Adventist church before he had gone on to other things, and he said, oh yeah, let me ask you one more question. Are you still insisting on that Sabbath thing? So there, going down this escalator in between subway stations in London, I began to have a Bible study with this stranger on the seventh-day Sabbath. I quoted Hebrews 4 to him, there remains a rest for the people of God. And he thought that was interesting, and finally he looked at his watch and said, well, I really have to go, praise the Lord, turned around, and he left, and I turned around and walked away, so I wouldn't have to talk to that guy anymore, I didn't see him anymore. I always hate to have that conversation. People have the craziest understandings of what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Now, I know if I ask you tonight, you would know how to answer that question. What's a Seventh-day Adventist? You'd give me a beautiful, eloquent answer that would convert me on the spot if I were not already a Seventh-day Adventist. 
But you know, most people out there that ask you the question have strange understandings about what an Adventist is. One guy said to me, oh, you're the people who go door to door handing out literature, aren't you? I think he was thinking about somebody else. I'm not sure it was Adventist he was thinking about. I know that the guy who said to me, you're the people that have that great choir that sings in Salt Lake City? I'm sure he was talking about Latter-day Saints. I don't think we do have a great choir in Salt Lake City. A lot of people say, oh, you Adventists, you're the people who don't drink coffee. Isn't that sad that that's all they know about us? Philip Yancey, who is a wonderful writer, has been to La Sierra a few times to talk uh, two times in his books. He talks about Adventists and coffee like that's the only thing that we stand for. He said he was on a book tour of all of media centers and he went to a, the Adventist Media Center and he said, it was one of the best organized media centers I've ever seen, but try to get a good cup of coffee in an Adventist Media Center, he said. <laughs> Is that all people know about us? I've heard something even stranger. A person told me one time that she heard that Adventists don't take showers on Saturday. <laughs> you didn't tell them that, did you? Where did we get that idea? Actually, don't let the kids hear this, but somebody told me that married Adventist people don't have sex on Saturday. Oh, they do. I, uh, I'm really glad to know that. Isn't it a shame what people know about us or think they know? And then let me ask you this. Who is authorized to answer the question? If the answer is printed in a denominational publishing house uh, pub uh, magazine or a book, if it's in a publication from a denominational publishing house, does that make it authoritative? I bet you we could go together to the ABC and choose almost any topic and find more than one opinions in books that are being for sale there in the ABC today. If someone makes a statement who is paid by the church, does that make the statement authoritative? A young pastor told me just a couple of weeks ago that a conference official in his conference told him, if you're not a Seventh-day Adventist, you're not a Christian. I don't think that's the official Seventh-day Adventist stance, even though it was given by a conference official. How long do you have to be a member of the church before your answer is authoritative? I've been an Adventist uh, virtually all my life. Does that mean that what I say is more... Uh, you're not as old as I am, are you? It's kind of No, I don't think you are. It, it, what I say, would it be more authoritative than what you say because I'm older than you? I don't think that's right either. You know, we define what an Adventist is a number of ways. Many times we define who an Adventist is by Adventist accomplishments. We, we quote uh, great people that are Adventists. And we talk about the number of members we have around the world and the number of pastors and the number of churches and, and the number of hospitals and and how much tithe that we've paid, and the number of schools. The problem is when you define by numbers, somebody always has better numbers than you do. Oh, that's not a very good game to get into. You know, in California, there are more Muslims than there are Seventh-day Adventists in North America. I don't think we better get into a numbers game. A billion Roman Catholics, not that many Seventh-day Adventists. You know, there are more than twice as many Americans in jail than there are Americans in North America. We haven't done a great job there somehow. There are 3,000 Adventists in the state of Alaska. But you know, every day in the United States, 3,000 kids start smoking. Now, I don't think we ought to do that. I don't think we ought to define by accomplishments Somebody else is going to have better numbers, better accomplishments than we do. How about if we define by behavior? A lot of us do that. We say an Adventist is someone who doesn't do this and doesn't do that and doesn't do that, and maybe we do this and we do that kind of thing. 
One of the problems with defining by behavior is that it presupposes that all our behavior is the same around the world, which it isn't. My friend Barry Gain, whom you know quite well, I'm sure, was a division youth director here for many years, tells a story about being out in an island somewhere on a hot summer day. He left his uh, coat at home, uh, went out to preach outdoors in the sun in a shirt and a tie, and uh, the elders came around the corner, and they were about to pray with him and introduce him, and uh, somebody looked at him, and he didn't have a coat on, and they all had coats on. And uh, one of the elders said to him, uh, you can't preach here without a coat on. And Barry said, it's a really hot day. I left my coat in the hotel. And one of the elders says, don't worry, we have a coat for people just like you. <laughs> we kept it off of a missionary we found one day, and he disappeared. And a minute later, he came back, Barry swears this is true, with a large woolen overcoat. And he handed it to Barry and said, if you're going to preach from the pulpit here you have to wear a coat. Barry put the coat on and he began to perspire so heavily. He said the sweat was running down his arm and getting in his Bible. He thought he was going to ruin his Bible. Uh, We don't do things the same all around the world. I was in a camp meeting in Holland a couple of years ago. I was preaching about the enduring grace of Jesus And I noticed in the middle, just a few rows back, there was a young mother, her husband, and three little tiny kids. And she wasn't paying much attention to me. The husband was sitting there taking lots of notes. The woman was looking around, playing with her kids. I didn't think I had her attention at all. And after church on Sabbath, she came up to me and she said, I don't believe a word you're saying. It's a kind of a hard thing to hear when you're in a strange country and you don't know too many people and... uh, She said, I don't believe what you're saying. And I said, well, what part don't you believe? She said, I don't believe the part that Jesus loves me no matter what I do. And I thought, oh, that's easy. And I opened my Bible to a verse and I read it to her. And she said, I've heard that verse before, but I don't believe it. I must have got the wrong verse. I turned to another one and she said, I've heard that one too. I don't believe it. I said to her, why don't you tell me about your father? She looked at me and said, why do you want to know about him? I said, I think I have a hunch why you don't believe that Jesus loves you unconditionally. Tell me about your dad. In the next few minutes, she began to tell me the story about growing up in the home of an Adventist pastor whose idea of sanctification was that women would never wear pants, always dresses. Some of you are in real trouble here tonight. (laughs) If you were in Holland. She said, uh, it gets cold in Holland in the winter. The ponds all freeze over. All the girls pull on their trousers and put their skates on and go out skating. I couldn't do it. It was too cold. In the dress that I had, I just couldn't do it. We'd go to school in the winter, and the girls would go out to recess. They'd pull their trousers on, and I always stayed inside in red because it was too cold running around for recess in the dress. She said, to this day, when my dad comes to visit me and I'm dressed in a pair of pants, within five minutes he says, can I take you downtown and buy a dress for you? I said, you really don't understand why you don't understand God's unconditional love? She looked at me and she began to cry. I put my arm around her and I said, you need to look in your dad's face and say, Appreciate all you've done for us, but you're not God. And I've got to relate to God the way I am relating to him. We don't do things the same way around the world, and for many reasons we don't do things. People have the own, their own uh, things that they emphasize. They have their own hang-ups from their childhood. We just don't do things around the world the same way. You know the story, don't you, about... Uh, The students at Cologne, the Adventist college in France, Sabbath afternoon after church, the French all went out to play soccer on the field in front of the dorm. The English thought that playing soccer on Sabbath was abominable, abominable, and they went hiking. The Italians thought that hiking on Sabbath was just terrible. So they went down to the lake and went swimming. 
the Swedes thought that swimming on Sabbath was a terrible thing to do. They just went down to the beach and got in their bathing suits and sunbathed. That was all. The Africans thought sunbathing was terrible. They were off inside a dorm, not enjoying the sun, doing something. And, of course, the Americans missed the whole thing because they were out to eat at a restaurant somewhere. <laughs> we just don't do things all the same way. We don't do it. It's a round world, and some things are different. Defining ourselves by behavior also ignores the fact that many who practice the same behaviors are not members of our church. You know, in California, it's against the law to smoke in any restaurant. But it would be silly to say that everyone who's not smoking in California restaurants is an Adventist. It's just not true. In Southern California especially, there are a lot of vegetarians. Folks, you can go to a Burger King in Southern California and order a Veggie Whopper, and nobody ever blinks. That's fine if you want a Veggie Whopper. But not everybody who's a vegetarian in Southern California is an Adventist. Defining ourselves by behavior ends up creating hierarchies of behavior. And so we begin to look at other people's sins and we say, those are the bad ones, my sins are not so bad. Their behavior is bad, my behavior is pretty good regardless of what I'm doing. And so we keep people out of church because they drink. But we don't refuse to baptize people who have terrible tempers who are really proud or envious, and those are the things that the Bible talks about over and over again. Listen to this from Steps to Christ. The drunkard is despised and told that his sin will exclude him from heaven, while pride and selfishness and covetousness too often go unrebuked. But these are the sins, listen, that are especially offensive to God. For they are contrary to the benevolence of his character, to that unselfish love which is the very atmosphere of the unfallen universe. He who falls into some of the grosser sins may feel a sense of his shame and poverty and his need of the grace of Christ, but pride feels no need, and so it closes the heart against Christ and the infinite blessings he came to give. When we begin to define ourselves by behavior, we tend to think other people's behavior is not as good as ours. And we have our favorite list, and we keep those people out of our churches. It seemed to me that it would be lovely if every Sabbath morning our churches smelled of alcohol and tobacco. Not because I want all of you to start smoking and drinking, but wouldn't it be nice if people who were caught by habits like that felt that there was a safe community where they could come and worship and give their habits to Jesus and let him work with it instead of us doing it. Wouldn't it be nice? Please understand me. Don't go home and tell them I'm trying to make the church smell like alcohol. Okay, so maybe we ought not to define who Adventists are by behavior either. The other way many of us define ourselves is by our central truths in our teaching, the evangelist Moffat said, a religion is known at its center. By what center does, do people know Seventh-day Adventists? I've only been here a few days on this campground, and already I've heard some interesting centers of people's faith. Uh, the central truths and teachings that some people love to talk to the the guest speakers who talk about God's grace. I've heard a few of them already. One man uh, belabored with me about the difference between the 144,000 and the great multitude in heaven. He may be right. I don't know. I asked him to study it out and come back and tell me when he came to the conclusion. Another man told me, a pastor told me, that he's just come from a church where one man's prime message is how evil it is for Sabbath school classes to sit their chairs around in a circle. He couldn't explain to me why that was evil, and I can't figure it out. Imagine if Seventh-day Adventists were defined by what is the central teaching of that man's religion. I grew up in an Adventist church that had at the heart 
of its definition. Things that we didn't do and things that we did do. I grew up in a church that said Seventh-day Adventists believe that it's wrong to go to movies, it's wrong to have drums in the music, it's wrong to drink caffeine, it's wrong to do this and it's wrong to do that. Some of you grew up in that same church. And many of the young people that I talk to today who are leaving the Seventh-day Adventist Church say that at the, re- at the heart of the church they're leaving is things like no drums and no music and no movies and no caffeine. I take every opportunity that I can wherever I am around the world to ask this question. How many of you are here tonight because at the heart of your spiritual experience is no caffeine. Anybody here? You see, I've asked that question for years and not one single Seventh-day Adventist has ever said to me, at the heart of my faith is no caffeine. You know why? Because we all understand that at the heart of our faith should be Jesus, not those other things that are on the periphery. And yet we're giving somebody the impression that caffeine and drums and movies is what's the center of our faith. And they don't think it's a very good faith and they're walking out the back door and it's almost tempting to applaud them. Because I don't want to hang around a church who has at its center no caffeine and no movies and no drums either. I want to be around a church where the center is Jesus, period. And all those other things will fall into place if that's what the center is. One of the problems with defining ourselves by our central truths and teachings is that it tends to give an idea that as long as the doctrines are right, behavior doesn't matter at all. And so we go to church on the seventh day of the week, and right after church we stand on the outside and we gossip about the people we've just been going to church with on the seventh day of the week. It doesn't quite work, does it? I was in um, Central Africa one time writing some stories for ADRA. And I interviewed a conference president in a little mountain village in Tanzania who told me about what it was like to grow up as an Adventist convert in this very village where we were talking years and years ago. And he told me about an early Adventist missionary who was sent from Europe down into Africa and he came to this village and the first thing he did was to hire the two biggest guys that he could find in the village. You two guys would probably have been hired right away. He hired them and he said, I want you to go around with me. Don't say a word. You go into the hut when I go into the hut and I want you to stand there like this and look as mean and ugly as you can and it shouldn't be hard for either one of you to do that. And so the missionary went hut by hut in this little village and he said to people, I'm writing your name down. We're taking a census of everybody in the village. And Saturday morning on the seventh day of the week, we're holding a church service here and I want you to be there and we'll take record by this census that we have. And then they went to the next house and they said the same thing, the next little hut, the two big guys standing there looking mean and ugly and the guy writing down the names and telling him, get to church on Saturday morning. Saturday morning, he opened the church. The church bells rang. They uh, got everybody in a big circle. And uh, the big guy stood at the door of the church or the entrance to the circle, whatever it was. And as everybody came in, they marked who was there and who was not there. And right after church, the missionary and the two guys went hut by hut, found the people who didn't come to church, and the two big guys beat them up. The president told me that the membership of the church grew by leaps and bounds those times. Everybody came to church. And he said to me, everybody hated the God of the Seventh-day Adventist church. The church heard what was going on. They didn't believe it. Sent somebody to watch. Sure enough. The conference president that I was talking to told me that On Sabbath morning, early on, before Sabbath school would start, the missionary and these two guys would walk around the steep roads that 
the village was carved out of, and they would look down into the gardens and see people working in their gardens. And the president said, one Saturday morning, my mother and I were in our garden. We were picking some vegetables, and we looked up, and there on the road was the missionary and his two thugs. And the missionary yelled down at my mother and me, get to church. And he pointed to the guys, and they went over to the side of the road, and they pushed a boulder off the side of the road, and it went going down the side of the mountain. And this man told me what it sounded like as the boulder came crashing down the, the mountainside. He said, my mother dove that way, I dove that way. The boulder landed right where we were standing. We got up, dusted ourselves off, and ran to church. Finally, thank goodness, the missionary was replaced by a man who went hut by hut, walked into the hut and said, I'm the new Adventist missionary. I apologize for what's been going on. Uh, we'd love to have you join us for church, but that's up to you. But we are going to start a school, and we'd love to have your children be part of our school. Quietly, one by one, as the school year began, the children began to wander into the school, including the man who was now the conference president in that place. He said the membership of the church didn't grow so fast, but people came to love the God of the Adventist church. And then our interview was over, and he excused himself. He had about a two-hour hike up over the mountain where that afternoon he was baptizing 200 people. It was a great day, a great story. Some people seem to believe as long as the doctrines are right, their behavior doesn't matter. Defining by our central truths and teaching also sometimes makes people act as if they had the whole when all they have is a part. As if study is now all over. We've found our truth. We don't need to read anymore. We don't need to study. Evangelism stops being a sharing of the good news and becomes debate. Who has the best doctrines? Who can prove their truth better than the next person? In the introduction to the Ministerial Association's book, which we usually call 27 Fundamental Beliefs, but the real title is Seventh-day Adventists Believe, is this incredible sentence, listen, recognizing that he who is the incarnation of truth is infinite, we humbly confess that there is still much truth to be discovered. Oh, I can like a church that says that. I don't like a church that says we don't need to learn anymore. We've got it all together. I love a church that says there's a lot more to be discovered. Because truth changes sometimes. Not the great foundational truths, but sometimes our understanding changes. We began telling people how many doctrines we had in 1872 when a synopsis of our faith said that we had 25 doctrines. By 1889, it had grown to 28 that were included in the publications of the church. In 1931, we published a book that had 22 principal features of our faith. And then in 1980, right after the general conference session, we published a book that said, or published a statement that says, now we have 27 fundamental beliefs. You know all of them, don't you? I'm sure you're all Seventh-day Adventists. You know 1 to 20. You don't? Come on. What's number one? Everybody together. Number one is Well, number one, of course, is about the Word of God, right? Well, which one is the Sabbath? Which of the 27 fundamental beliefs about the Sabbath? Anybody? You would think that would have been a good number. <laughs> it's, uh, it's number 19. I don't know how that happened. Hey, let me give you a multiple choice question. This would be better, okay? Is the fundamental belief statement about Bible study, okay? The fundamental belief statement about Bible study. Would you find that in the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, in the doctrine of the remnant people, or in the doctrine of prayer? 
the fundamental belief statement about the importance of Bible study in the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, in the doctrine of the remnant people, or the doctrine of prayer. How many of you think it's in the doctrine of the Holy Spirit? Let me see your hands. Oh, good idea. Several of you. I think we fooled. No, actually, it's not there. That's number five, and it would have been a good place, but it's not there. How many of you think it is uh, in the doctrine of the remnant people, how important Bible study is? Good for you. No, it's not there either. That's number 12. It would have been a good place for it. Uh, you, if you're good at multiple choice, this next part should be good. <clears throat> how many of you think the fundamental belief statement about Bible study is in the doctrine of prayer? Let me see your hand. Oh, you're so smart. <clears throat> Actually, there is no doctrine about prayer. Isn't that interesting? Seventh-day Adventists have 27 fundamental beliefs. Not one of them is about prayer. In fact, in the fundamental belief statement, you will not find the word prayer. I first discovered it in the General Conference building in Washington, D.C. I couldn't believe it. I looked through the statement. I said, what did I miss here? I read it three times. I couldn't find the word prayer. It's not there. Seventh-day Adventists, you and I don't have a fundamental doctrine about prayer. I went to a friend of mine who worked in the GC building who was at the 1980 General Conference session where they put the statement of fundamental beliefs together. I said, did you guys miss something? We don't have a fundamental belief statement about prayer. And he said to me, we thought we could take some things for granted. You know, if I had been there in 1980, I could have taken something else for granted. I don't think it would have been prayer. Would it have been for you? I will guarantee you that before you're dead, the Seventh-day Adventist Church will come up with another fundamental belief statement, and it'll be about prayer. We miss that one, folks. And we believe in prayer. So I'm trying to make the point, not that we don't have a belief about prayer, but that we can't say everything we believe is contained in the 27 fundamental beliefs. The biggest problem with defining ourselves by our central truths and teaching, though, is that we begin treating all doctrines as if they were of equal importance. And so we take the doctrine of stewardship which is how much we give to God, and we place it side by side, the doctrine of salvation, which is about how much God gives to us, and my friends, they are not of equal importance. Listen to this statement. It's uh, found in a manuscript, number 31, written in the year 1890. There is one great central truth to be kept ever before the mind in the searching of the scriptures. Here's the one great central truth. Christ and him crucified. Listen, every other truth is invested with influence and power corresponding to its relation to this theme. Not all doctrines are of equal importance. The great central truth is about Jesus and what he did for you and me. And all the other truths are invested in influence and power as they correspond to the great central truth. Gospel Workers, page 315, happens to be my favorite Ellen White quotation. It goes like this. The sacrifice of Christ is an atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truths cluster. Now listen, in order to be rightly understood and appreciated, every truth in the Word of God, from Genesis to Revelation, must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. You want your neighbors to understand the truth of the Seventh-day Sabbath? Then you must present it to them in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. You want your neighbors to get as excited as you are about the second coming, then you have to talk about the second coming in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. And I'm here tonight to tell you, if you're not talking about what Jesus did for us on the cross and in being raised for us, 
If Jesus isn't the fundamental, central part of your belief, you're not a Seventh-day Adventist. Talk all you want about the Seventh-day Sabbath. But if your focus about the Seventh-day Sabbath is what you shouldn't do on Sabbath afternoon after church, you're not preaching it in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. Tell me you're waiting for Jesus to come and tell me all the things that you're, you think are going to happen before that time, the time of trouble and the running to the rocks and the mountains. If you're not talking about the second coming and the light that streams from the cross of Calvary, you're not a Seventh-day Adventist. When I was a new Bible teacher in Adventist High School, I had a great big chart on the wall in front of my desk written by a man uh, whom I've asked permission to tell this story. His name is Gordon Collier. I don't know if you've ever seen anything he's done. This man became an expert in the end of time. He knew everything there was to know about the time of trouble and the Sunday laws and the persecution and which churches are going to do what to what people around the world. He knew it all. And he put it in a four-color chart with little timelines. And this happened before this, and this happened last, and this was going on at all. And this big, big chart was sitting on, uh, posted to the wall in front of my desk when I was first teaching. And I would go to be preparing my lesson for the day, and I would look up, and I would, I would get lost in all of the details of the last days. And all of a sudden the bell would ring and I would go to my class and I wasn't ready because I was concentrating on that. But it got worse than that because I began to realize that I was getting lost in the order of events in the last days. And I was concentrating on that and I really wasn't talking too much about who was coming back in the clouds of glory. One day in the second year that I was teaching, I stood up from my desk and I took that chart off the wall and I rolled it up and I put it away and I never got it out again. And years went by. Years and years went by and one day I was asked to come to the little elementary school where I had gone to school and preached for an alumni gathering and I did and I was standing in the pulpit looking over the crowd and preaching about the grace of Christ and uh, I looked down and there was Gordon Collier sitting over there. And I began to think, oh boy, I'm not talking about what he thinks I ought to be talking about. And he's going to get me after this sermon is over. I know that he's going to come up to me and talk to me. I got through shaking hands with everybody after the church service and I, I uh, didn't see him. And, and then we had a big potluck and I was eating and I looked and over in the corner of the room there was Gordon and he stood up and he began to walk straight for me. And I said to my wife, he's coming after me now. Look, he's coming over here. And he's going to tell me about how I need to be preaching about the end of time. And as he came closer and he was looking right at me, I stood up and I reached out my hand and I said, my name is Stuart Tyner, Elder Collier. I'm glad to meet you. And he looked at me and he said, how do you know who I am? I said, well, I was a young Bible teacher. I used to have your chart right on the wall in front of me. Every day I'd go into my office and I'd see your name down in the corner of the chart. And I'd look at all the things that you had done about the end of time. And Gordon said to me, oh, Stuart, I'm so sorry. That's how you know me. I said, really? Why do you say that? He said, you know, Stuart, I, I began to realize that I was concentrating on all the details of the time of trouble and I wasn't studying the end of time and the light that shone from the cross of Calvary. I said, Gordon, what are you doing these days? Gordon said, I'm going everywhere I can preaching to people about the grace of Jesus Christ. It's a great moment in my life to see the change in that man because he discovered what was really central to Seventh-day Adventists. My friends, tonight I'm here to tell you that Seventh-day Adventists have at the center of their life one fundamental belief, and that is that Jesus came from heaven because we can't get to heaven by ourselves, and he lived a life on this earth, and he died for you and me. 
and it was raised by the power of the Father and He's back in heaven waiting for you and me to get there by His righteousness, by His merit, because of what He has done, not because of anything that we've done to get there. Here's the gospel. It's found in Colossians chapter 1 and chapter 2. I put together a couple of verses. Listen. The Father has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ when you were dead in your sins and in your sinful nature. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all of our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us. He took it away and nailed it to his cross. That's the gospel. Jesus giving life to people who were dead in their sins. I don't know if you've been around dead people too much. My wife is a hospice nurse. Her entire career is about making the families of dying people comfortable and taking the pain away from dying people. Many nights in the middle of the night, my wife will get a phone call. We'll be awakened suddenly, and uh, she'll quit talking and hang up the phone, and I'll say, what's going on? And she'll say, one of my patients is dying. And I say, Karen, all of your patients are dying. You're a hospice nurse. What's going on? And she said, well, there's a phrase they use, actively dying. My wife gets involved, and she's a wonderful chaplain. Years ago, when I was in college, I also had a connection with people that were dying. And I never forget when I read a verse like this about Jesus giving life to people who are dead in sins. I was in college, but I was working at night in a hospital, a hospital of, uh, of um, war veterans, so they were all older men. And I had a pretty easy assignment, and I would be studying my college uh, classwork at night, and, and somebody up in the hospital would die, and they would say, well, Stuart has a pretty easy assignment, and they'd ring the phone on the desk, and they'd say, would you come up and help us take this guy that just died down to the morgue? And so I'd be studying in the middle of the night. It was dark and quiet, and I was studying hard. It was very quiet, and all of a sudden, the phone would ring and scare me a little bit, and somebody would say, a guy died in the hospital. Will you go up? And I'd have to walk up these silent, dark corridors, and I'd, I'd get past all the people that were breathing heavenly, cross the street, go up an elevator to the ward where this guy had died. And it was my job to go over and like, make sure the man was dead, put the little sheet over his head, and then I would take the bed that he was in, which all had wheels, and we would wheel it down the hall of the ward and down the corridor, and the little wheels on the tile would make a certain little sound. Thumpity, 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 thumpity. It's kind of the song of taking the dead to the morgue that I began to experience. <laughs> went down to an elevator that went all the way down to the morgue. I had my own key to the morgue. And I would turn it there and open it. And you know, I hope I'm not uh, upsetting anybody, but you know a morgue has a big refrigerator and in the refrigerator, there are these cold tin trays with behind little square doors. You open a door, and there's a tin tray, and you bring it out, and you take the man who is deceased, and you put them on the tin tray, put them back in the refrigerator, and shut the door. That was my job almost every single night that I worked. Through the dark, up the elevator, thumpity, 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 down, and put the guy on the tin tray. I didn't like the job at all. Every now and then, a person would die that was a big guy. I'd ask the guy that worked in the ward to go with me. He'd push part of the bed. I'd push part of the bed. We'd take the guy, put him on, and then we'd get back. One night, I got a call, went through the dark corridors across the street, up the elevator to the place where the guy died. Sure enough, he was dead. What I didn't know was that just before this man had died, the last thing that he had done was to take a big gulp of air. He went, <gasps> and then he died. And I checked him. Sure enough, he was dead. We wheeled the bed. Now, don't get ahead of me in this story. 
wheeled him down the hall, thumpity thumpity, down the elevator to the morgue, went over to the morgue. I opened the door to pull out the tray, and somebody was in there already. So, excuse me, I went to the next one, <laughs> opened the door, somebody was there, somebody was there, all three of the trays down below. I had to go up to the high level up here. You open the door and you pull the tray out like this. Nobody was there, so I reached over. The other guy was at the guy's feet. I got underneath his arms to pick him up. Remember, the last thing he died was to go, <gasps> like that, and all the air that he gulped was inside his lungs. I reached underneath his arms to pick him up, and we had to kind of get ready, get set. I had to put him up on this big thing like that, and as I reached and pulled up on his arms like this, I compressed his arms together, his his lungs compressed, and all that big gulp of air that was inside came up over his vocal cords and out. And as I picked him up, he said, <laughs> It's a true story. It's a true story. I will never forget what he said. <laughs> What happened next is also the truth. I jumped over this tray that was there. It's a true story. The next thing I knew, I was climbing up to a window that was up there, straight up the wall. And holding on to the window, I heard laughter behind me. And I looked, and the guy that was helping me was lying on the floor laughing at what had happened. I thought the man had come to life. But you know what? Dead people don't come to life. I'm going to hear to tell you tonight, only Jesus brings people who are dead back to life. That's what you and I are about. The great gospel message that Jesus has brought us back to life. If we don't have something to define ourselves with and be proud of and, and praise the Lord for, nobody in the world does. Thank God that he's brought us to life. God bless you tonight.